Becky looked great in her black dress, maybe even too good. I'm a pretty laid-back person, but I pay attention to things that are important to me, my wife is one of those things. Over the past 12 months, I've noticed that Tom Burton has a thing for Becky, my wife of 24 years. He was rather guarded about it, but it was obvious to me. I could read his mind like a book whenever we found ourselves at the same social gathering, he would somehow gravitate toward Becky, especially if I was busy doing something else. I know that couples can't be around each other all the time, and even trying to do so is unhealthy. One of the purposes of companionship is to meet and interact with people who are not your spouse or close relatives. However, I also realized that Burton was too attentive to Becky. He was tonight too smooth. In her 44 years, Becky was still a very attractive, energetic woman, and Tom Burton decided he wanted to try her on. I had other plans. Becky worked as a nurse at the local hospital. Lorraine Burton, Tom's wife, worked in the administrative department of the same hospital. Because of this, the Burtons and I often met at the same parties and fundraisers. This gave Tom Burton the opportunity to socialize with Becky on a fairly regular basis. I didn't distrust Becky, I just realized that ignoring Tom's plans would be a very foolish mistake on my part. At the very least, I would interfere with him, at worst, I'd kick his ass. I had no illusions about my ability to flog the bastard, but if he got too close to Becky and started seriously threatening my marriage, I would have to do it. I accepted it as a basic part of life, like breathing. If a man won't fight for his family, he's just not a man. Getting kicked in the head is more likely to boost your pride and self-respect than burying your head in the sand, especially when you're fighting for family and honor. I was talking to Mrs. Zimmer, and Becky was at the other end of the room. We were at a retirement party for Dr. Wilkes, who had worked at the hospital for over 40 years. Mrs. Zimmer was a delightful woman, and I usually enjoyed spending time talking with her. Many years ago, I dated her niece. At parties, she never forgot. She must have noticed that I wasn't giving her my full attention. Dave, you're not a good influence on my ego. You hardly pay any attention to my clever observations, let alone my many anecdotes. Becky is quite capable of taking care of herself, she allowed. Lorraine's husband might as well try peeing on a rope, Mrs. Zimmer left. I haven't heard that expression since my father passed away. I'm glad you think so, but if you noticed his advances, why didn't Becky? Do you think she doesn't realize he's drawn to her like a moth to a flame? Steve misses him, or ask. He's always chatting her up at these parties. In my long life, I've gotten used to disregarding the concept of coincidences. They don't happen. Don't look for arguments from me, Mrs. Zimmer, I agreed. I tried to diplomatically hint to Becky that our friend Tom wanted to get into her thong. I grinned when the older woman raised her eyebrows at my terminology, then she smiled. I think Becky can wear a thong, that fashion idea came after all possible thongs were a thing of the past for me, she grinned. I'm afraid my goal now is to conceal and support, not to expose and seduce. Thirty years ago, it would have been different. For some reason, my mind rebelled against the mental image her words conjured up. I thought I did a good job of keeping my thoughts off my face. Slowly, I turned back to Becky. As I approached, Tom Barton had mysteriously disappeared. I realized that he must be watching me as closely as I was watching him, this only reinforced my opinion that he wanted to get Becky into bed. Our honey, greeted Becky, I hope you're having a good time since you left me alone for so long. I know you weren't alone, Becky. Have you noticed that Romeo always disappears when I walk up? I asked. You're not going to start that again, are you? Steve, Becky demanded. Tom was just being polite. He left for Lorraine's before you were even in sight. Your paranoia is taking over again, Becky. This guy is working with you. It's very obvious to the other man. He's quite patient but determined. I can see it quite clearly, I insisted. You see the other man being polite to me, and that makes you jealous, Becky objected. You talk to different women all the time, but I don't accuse you of trying to seduce them. Quite right, Becky. I talk to all kinds of women. I don't spend most of my time with any particular woman. That's the difference, I objected. 
Tom and Lorraine are happily married, Dave. You need to relax a little and trust me more. I've gone 24 years without ever falling off the loyalty wagon, Becky objected. I'm not even as big a coquette as many wives my age. I know that, Becky. I'm not accusing you of anything, I replied. I just want you to realize that Tom is doing everything he can to seduce you. I want you to know that and not give him the opportunity to compromise your honor because he will if he can. A few of Becky's nurses stopped by the joke with us, and the conversation about Tom Burton was over for the rest of the evening. I stayed a little closer to Becky, and Burton avoided us. As a man, he knew instinctively that I could tell he was sniffing around Becky. In my opinion, his patience made him very dangerous. For a few months, everything went smoothly. I realized it was because we didn't run into Lorraine and Tom anywhere. I knew that avoiding them wasn't going to solve the problem either. Becky had to realize that Tom was a threat to our marriage, or I would have to convince him that he was in big trouble if he continued with his plan to seduce my wife. I work for an insurance company, and the owners are always trying to get the company's name in the local papers. I was to attend a training session to learn all about annuities. I was to become the company's expert in this department. The seminar was held in Jacksonville and lasted a week. I was to leave on Sunday and return on Saturday. All the newspapers wrote about it, along with my picture. It was good press, and the company made sure people knew they could benefit from my experience. The story was on page 3 of our small town newspaper. It came off the week before I left and detailed my entire itinerary. I soon discovered that people actually read such notes. It was the Saturday afternoon before I was scheduled to fly out to Jacksonville. I was helping a neighbor across the street fix his lawnmower. He didn't have the key we needed, so I went across the street to my garage to get mine. I noticed that the light was blinking, indicating that the phone was in use. For no good reason, I decided to eavesdrop on the conversation. It's just dinner, Becky, honestly. I'll be a complete gentleman. I'd like to have a nice evening over dinner with a friend without her jealous husband staring at me, said a male voice. You know Dave doesn't let us say a word without losing our temper. Have you done something that makes him distrust you? Of course not, Tom, Becky replied, somewhat irritably. His jealousy has no foundation. What confuses me is that he's always watching you and trying to intimidate you. It was that damn Tom Burton who was trying to charm Becky. I covered the mouthpiece with my hands so my heavy breathing couldn't be heard. Believe me, Becky, he's not intimidating me in the least, Burton boasted. I'm too much of a gentleman to make a public scene and embarrass you. Things will only get worse if I give Dave a lesson in manners. I think it would be wiser to just avoid him. Don't make the mistake of thinking Dave will learn quickly if you're the instructor, Tom, Becky cautioned. Don't take Dave lightly. He wouldn't think of messing with you if he thought you were acting inappropriately with me. I know he has a temper. He doesn't know I'm a brown belt, and I'd have no trouble rendering him helpless. I just find that kind of bravado unseemly unless I'm being provoked. I have no intention of hurting Dave, so don't worry about that, Burton replied. Well, good, Tom, because that wouldn't be easy, and I wouldn't tolerate it even if it were, Becky replied. Was Becky beginning to get smart? Even she had to realize what Burton was getting at. I mentally flagged that I needed to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the jerk, and pretty soon. All of this takes us away from the reason I called, Burton continued. Like I said, Lorraine has to go to her mother's house next weekend. Since it's going to be just the two of us, it would make sense for us to get together for a nice dinner, no strings attached. I don't know, Tom. Dave's going to be very upset. I know that for a fact, Becky reasoned correctly. If he finds out, things could get ugly fast. He has no reason to find out, Becky. I'd like to meet you at the Hyatt Hotel across the river Friday night at 7 o'clock, but I hate to see you so afraid of your husband. If you think he will do you bodily harm, then we certainly shouldn't meet. I will protect you when you are with me, but I can't watch you all the time. However, no one will recognize us at the restaurant, and I'll even pick you up at your house if you want, the creep offered. No, I wouldn't want you to pick me up, Tom. 
Someone might see you and misunderstand. Not that I'm afraid of Dave, Becky replied. I'll meet you there, but you have to realize we're only having dinner and nothing else, okay? Of course, Becky, Burton agreed. We're just going to enjoy a nice, quiet dinner. There's no reason why we can't do this as friends. As soon as they hung up, I slammed the phone down and walked across the street, completely forgetting about the wrench I'd come for. I was angrier than ever. Becky dropped me off at the airport on Sunday afternoon. She had been unusually warm and romantic the previous evening. By then, I had devised a plan that allowed me to get my anger under control. I still wanted to fight back against Becky. I wanted her to realize that I wasn't some spineless weakling to play with. If giving in to the only woman you've ever wanted or loved is being a weakling, then put me first on the list. When Becky came to bed naked and started making magic with the little guy, he and I both responded to love a woman that much as to have a weakness. Becky was my Achilles heel. I could never refuse her anything in bed, and that night I didn't. The next morning, I wasn't happy with myself, but my soldier was quite pleased. We kissed and told each other how much we love each other. We agreed that Becky would pick me up the following Saturday, and I promised to call home every night. I didn't bother to mention that I had changed my route a bit. It took a few dozen phone calls from Jacksonville and a lot of begging, whining, insisting, and threatening, but I got it all arranged. Friday night, I know, I was back in town and putting the finishing touches on my plan. I bought dark-rimmed glasses and a bad wig and headed to the Hyatt around 6. I figured that if plan A failed, I would be close enough to Burton to carry out plan B, which was to bludgeon Burton with a cold weapon in the restaurant and possibly go to jail. I wasn't going to let Becky leave with that creep, no matter what else happened. It had cost me $500 to convince the hotel management to keep the five tables I needed, but it was necessary to carry out my plan. I was sipping a beer and studying the menu when Tom and Becky were shown to their table. Somehow it ended up right next to mine. Becky was dressed to the hilt and looked beautiful. I examined myself in the mirror and realized that even if Becky was looking for me, she would never recognize me with unkempt hair, glasses, and a new suit studying the menu. I caught most of their conversation. Becky seemed a little nervous, Button was working his ass off trying to dispel her doubts. He wasn't pushy, nor did I expect him to be. He was laying the groundwork for seduction before taking the bait. The prey had to be lulled into a sense of security and well-being. That's where I stepped in. Becky wasn't going to become Burton's next meal while she was married to me, and I wasn't in jail or the hospital. Suddenly, Becky threw her head up and opened her mouth, then she raised her menu to cover her face except for one eye. I turned to look in the direction she was looking. I couldn't hold back a smile as I watched Nancy Wall being escorted to her table by a very distinguished gentleman. Even in her sixties, Nancy was very well-groomed. Her escort was very attentive, holding her hand and whispering in her ear as they passed Becky's table to be seated in the back of the restaurant. Becky's surprise at seeing her mother in the restaurant was obvious, her horror at being accompanied by someone other than her father was priceless. Becky continued to look in her mother's direction, holding the menu in front of her face. Nancy seemed too interested in her escort to even glance in Becky's direction. I was beginning to enjoy the drama unfolding. Becky, on the other hand, looked tense and very nervous. I knew she was contemplating whether or not to tell Burton that her mother had just walked into the restaurant with a strange man. After all, she had to realize how humiliating it would be to explain that her saintly mother might turn out to be a common whore. My ribs arrived, and they were delicious. The beer was cold, and the drama was top-notch. I waited for the next act. Becky had just ordered as she gasped and held a napkin to her face. I turned my head again to see the cause of her confusion. Gloria Reynolds looked incredible in a short red dress with narrow straps and a very low neckline. While her gentleman friend held a chair for her, and she bent over to pull the dress up, I had the honor of viewing the bountiful breasts. They were seated at a table about 20 feet away from Becky. The fact that Becky's younger sister was having dinner with her former high school boyfriend did not go unnoticed by Becky. Anger flashed across her face when she saw Jason Whitman caress Gloria's face and then take her hands in his. There was no reason Gloria couldn't enjoy a quiet dinner with a friend. I assumed her husband, Bob, 
was taking good care of their three children. Gloria did seem to be having a good time. I ordered a chocolate mousse and waited. Becky didn't show much interest in her dinner, she kept hiding her face, trying to watch her mother and sister who seemed to be blatantly disregarding their marriage vows. Her excitement was palpable. I was finishing my mousse when Becky began to sob. Her chest was rising and falling rapidly, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. What could have caused such an emotional reaction? I turned and saw Jennifer Reed walk in with Bruce Davis. I thought Gloria looked incredible, but Jennifer was just stunning. All heads turned to watch her walk to her table, which was two tables away from her mother's table. The only time I've ever seen Jen more beautiful was at her wedding last year. It was a wonderful event, and she glowed as I walked her down the aisle and placed her hand in Joe Stanton's. As far as I remembered, Bruce Davis had been Jen's date to her prom. Becky was furious. She and I had discussed Jen's choice of husband many times. We agreed that Joe was a wonderful young man, hardworking, educated, handsome, and absolutely devoted to our daughter. The situation was made worse by Bruce Davis's rather habitual touching of Jen's hands. He finally took her hands in his as she laughed at some private joke. Becky rose from her chair and was in front of Jen's face in less than five seconds. She was furious and made no attempt to contain her voice as she berated our daughter. What do you think you're doing here without your husband? Becky demanded. Joe would never let that happen. I'm not going to let you act like a common whore and ruin your marriage to a fine man. I want you to come with me right now. I'm taking you home. By the time Becky had finished her tirade and was staring at Jen, Nancy and Gloria came up behind her. Don't be such a prude, sis, Gloria rebuked her. Jen just wants to have a quiet dinner with a friend. What's that bug up your ass? Gloria had never been known for subtlety. Becky turned to face her mother and sister. Her anger seemed to increase exponentially at the sight of them. What is wrong with you two? Becky shouted. You have what? You disrespect daddy so much, mom? How could you do that, Gloria, you have three beautiful children and a loving husband? What do you think, by this time there was almost pandemonium in the establishment? All conversation had stopped, and all the customers were frozen. It was like a train wreck in slow motion, no one could take their eyes off the scene playing out. Actually, it wasn't quite like that. Tom Burton decided that now would be a good time to end the evening. He tossed a $100 bill on the table and walked around the far end of the room, clearly heading for the door. I was right behind him. Once outside, I took off my wig and tossed my glasses onto the sidewalk, shouting his name. His shoulders hunched as if he'd been shot in the back. He turned around slowly. I'm told you're some kind of karate expert or something, Tom, I bellowed. Why don't you show me what you can do? I don't want any trouble, Dave. Becky hit on me, it was her idea, and I just went along with it, he lied. She's been after me for months. You pathetic sucker, I snapped back. The fact that you're chasing after my wife means you need trouble, and you damn well found it. Let's dance, asshole. Tom colored himself white, a color rarely seen in nature. Without another word, he spun around and practically ran down the street. At that speed, he'd make it a couple of blocks before he realized he had to get his car from the valet. Maybe he'd get a cab instead. I turned toward the restaurant door and came face to face with Becky. Standing behind her were Jen, Gloria, and Nancy. Dave, I never, he was the one. I'm so ashamed, Becky sobbed, jamming her face into the floor and sobbing pitifully. I looked at Becky's family, my mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, and daughter, all looking at me and waiting. I knew what I had to do. The only way to convince them to participate in the evening's charade was to promise that I would make every effort to mend my relationship with Becky. They were willing to help, but only after I told them I didn't want a divorce or separation. Now they were waiting. I walked over to Becky, put my fingers under her chin, and lifted her head so she would look at me. I saw shame and fear. It both pleased and saddened me at the same time. I was glad that she had enough pride to be ashamed and afraid that she had lost me. It saddened me that it had come to this. Becky, 
I want you to admit that I was right about that guy. I want you to admit that you had no right to go to dinner with another man without my knowledge and consent. I want you to admit to your mother, sister, and daughter that you deserve whatever punishment I come up with and that you will accept it, I demanded. I want that right now, or I want you out of my house. Dave's right. I really screwed up. I tried to pretend everything was okay with my dinner with Tom, but I knew what he wanted. I had no intention of giving it to him, but that's nitpicking. I had betrayed Dave when I accepted the offer, and deep down, I knew it. I had no trouble seeing that it was so when you all showed up with your husbands, Becky admitted. I was horrified by your behavior, all of you. I loved and respected you and your husbands. I was disgusted to see you cheating on them. It made me sick. It took me a while to realize what you all were really doing. I embarrassed myself in front of the people who meant the most to me. My own mother, sister, and daughter think I'm a cheap whore. Wait, I'm wrong, you don't think it, you know it, she complained. The worst thing is what I did to Dave. He warned me. He tried to tell me about Tom, but Tom wasn't the problem. The problem was me. I was vain and stubborn and stupid. There are always people like Tom, they could never succeed if wives remembered what was important. I thank God I have a man like Dave if I still have one, Becky sobbed. It was obvious Becky was suffering, but I think we all thought she deserved it. Consequences are a bitch. Becky was learning that now. Dave, it's up to you to decide what happens now, Becky finished. Well, Dad, I know what decision you better make if you don't want to change your grandson's diapers alone, Jen interjected. And that's only seven months away. Can't you just tell mommy you love her and let the rest work itself out? You wouldn't break a promise to your daughter, would you? Becky, you're making me so damn mad, I whispered. That's it, daddy. Talk her down, Jen giggled, and her grandmother and aunt laughed with her. Mom, he's softening up. We've all seen what daddy becomes when he's really mad. That Tom was as close to taking a punch as a person can be. He's just upset with you, mom. I pulled Becky to me and hugged her tightly. I wasn't sure if I had forgiven her, but I had no doubt that I loved her. I guess that's why marriage is so hard. When your daughter tells you she's going to give you a grandchild, it overshadows all the crap you've had to put up with along the way. For me, love and family are all I really need or want. Don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, and if you're curious to see where this journey takes us next, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss a single update. Your support is what keeps this channel alive and kicking, and every like, comment, and share means the world to us. We've got plenty more stories, insights, and surprises coming your way, so stay tuned for the next video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.